I want to read again a scripture that I read uh, a couple of weeks ago, but it um, really um, holds together um, all that I've been trying to do over the last several weeks. Uh, today might be the last one. Next week there will be no class because we're all going to be eating like um, guzzlers out in the, uh, in the kitchen. But, uh, and I may do another one where I sum up uh, both Jan Hus, who's our subject today, um, and of course all that this means in terms of the Reformation. But I just want to read from uh, Psalm 44. And, um, and the first eight verses. O oh God, we have heard with our ears, our fathers have told us, what deeds you performed in their days, in the days of old. You with your own hand drove out the nations, but them you planted. You afflicted the peoples, but them you set free. For by their own sword they did not win the land, nor did their own arm save them but your right hand and your arm, and the light of your face, for you delighted in them. You are my king, O God, ordain salvation for Jacob. Through you we will push down foes, through your name we tread down those who rise against us. For not in my bow do I trust, nor can my sword save me, but you have saved us from our foes, and have put to shame those who hate us. In God we have boasted continually, and we will give thanks to your name forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we have heard and we are hearing what our fathers did. And we stand grateful for the heritage in which we stand. But, O oh Lord our God, ultimately, it is by your grace we are what we are and where we are. And we pray that you will teach us to have the courage of our forefathers, <coughs> the faith of our forefathers, and ultimately the desire of our forefathers to worship you in spirit and in truth. Bless us now then as we consider the life of one of your servants who died for you. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> this morning, I want you to wander with me, as it were, um, into the land of Czechoslovakia. How many of you are familiar with this saying, they cook their goose? How many of you have heard that saying? Have you ever cooked your goose? You never have. That's very good. Anyway, do you know what it means to cook your goose? You do something really silly and you affect everything you've been trying to say. Well, this phrase comes from Jan Hus. Hus in Czechoslovak is goose. And of course, he was martyred by being burnt to death. So really, they cook their goose. But we will find that um, Luther, and maybe Jan himself, but certainly Luther, took this uh, for himself <coughs> and uh, was able to use it to great effect in establishing them himself <coughs> as being in the footsteps and the tradition of Jan Hus. We call him in anglicized word John Hus, but in fact, um, Jan Hus is the way the Czechoslovaks would say. Uh, he was born in Bohemia, which is a part of the Czechoslovak Republic. Um, in 1369, he was born in the eastern part of it. And he lived there with his family in poverty. His mother taught him how to pray. As to how uh, effective and um, all-inclusive that praying is, we, we, we don't know. But he records that she taught him how to pray. But he wished to escape the poverty in which he lived. And so he went to Prague. Any of you been to Prague? It's 
it, you've been to Prague, Jan? <coughs> uh, a friend of mine sent me an email, um, and uh, he told me that um, he, had, he had met with a Czechoslovak Christian um, recently. In, in England, you can get a three-day trip to, to, to Prague for minimal amount of money. Uh, you fly in, you stay in a hotel, spend three days, and then back home again. I won't do it, but it's certainly um, uh, feasible and possible. Um, he, he went to Prague, and he earned his living uh, by singing and by working in different church buildings. Do you remember anybody else who earned a living uh, singing and, and just working around church buildings? Martin Luther. Anyway, uh, he eventually uh, decided to enroll at Charles University, uh, which is in Prague, named for a king, just a matter of uh, 50 years before uh, Huss got there. And in fact, amusingly, I suppose, uh, my, uh, one of Anne's nephews um, has finally decided that he would like to have a girlfriend. And um, he's 25 or 26. He has a very well-qualified, uh, works for Ernst & Young, and has this, um, this lady friend uh, who is a lawyer. And in her bio, because I was silly enough to go and look at it and Googled it, she spent a year at Charles University. So I'm really looking forward to meeting her. I hope that he will introduce me to her, and I'll find out a little bit more firsthand although I'm sure that Charles University bears no relation to the work that uh, Huss did. He soon distinguished himself as a competent scholar. Uh, he didn't come with a great um, undergraduate education, but he was soon uh, majoring in philosophy, and he was highly thought of in the philosophy department. And in 1398, began to teach at Charles University. But he still wasn't comfortable and decided he would study theology. I thought to become a priest in order to secure a quiet life, a good livelihood, and dress, and be held in high esteem by men. Priesthood has changed somewhat, hasn't it? <laughs> That's what Pastor Holtz came into the ministry in order to have a, a good lovely livelihood and a quiet life. And I know I went into the ministry for that. And uh, again, a life of disappointment. <laughs> he, he studied theology, as I said, and uh, he was ordained into the priesthood in 1400, 1401, about that time. <clears throat> At that time, Wycliffe appears in Prague. And he didn't go there, Scott, but his books went there. A man called Jerome of Prague, he's known as Jerome of Prague. If, if you're reading something, you might find his name in Latin, Hieronymus of Prague, uh, who was a, a maverick in terms of being a, <coughs> a, a student and a, and a scholar and a teacher. Uh, he studied um, in Paris, he studied in Charles University. He was 10 years younger than, than, than Huss. Studied in, in, in Charles University. He went to Paris, to Germany, uh, Heidelberg, Cologne, and ultimately came to Oxford. And there he discovered the writings of John Wycliffe. And so he took them with him back to Prague. Was impressed with him. Huss read some of them and immediately they gripped his imagination. They seemed to be <coughs> saying something that he believed needed to be said. Now, Huss was proving to himself to be, at this time, a very able preacher. And a chapel had been built in Prague called Bethlehem Chapel, which is still standing. Seats 3,000 people. Now, Prague wouldn't have had a population of much more than 30,000, I suppose. And so have a congregation of 3,000 every Sunday, and, and maybe more often than that. And there Huss preached with great acceptation 
and with significant effect. And people began to take seriously the whole issue of what it was like to belong to the Roman church. He, he took such great interest in Wycliffe's writings that in fact in 1412 he preached a sermon on the church which was really verbatim Wycliffe's thesis on De Ecclesia, the church. And it could be said that the common people heard him gladly. The, 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 the nobility heard him too. He was popular with every class of, humanity, of, of society for his preaching. And the thing was that made his preaching so effective, he preached in Czechoslovak. He didn't preach in Latin. Many people, of course, didn't understand Latin. And, uh, and those who said they understood it were as rudimentary. As, uh, as it could possibly be. Uh, when I go home to Wales, if, if I say, uh, I meet people and they say they're Welsh, and I speak to them in Welsh, well, somebody here showed me some Welsh music uh, this morning, and uh, they're going to sing it. Uh, one of the lion girls is going to sing this, um, this Welsh thing, Hina Blentin Arvaman West. I got a feeling that... Uh, <laughs> that when I say it, many people won't have a clue what I'm saying. And so it would be true for, uh, for them as they go to sing in Wales uh, this summer, be that as it may. And so they heard him gladly. They particularly liked the way in which he exposed the errors that were to be seen, obviously, in the church around them. Now, you've got to understand as I've said before about the Waldensians and uh, Thomas Bradwardine and John Wycliffe, they were ardent supporters of the church. What they wanted was reform. They wanted it to conform to the word of God and what God's word said. That's happened again. It happens now in the PCUSA. There are some good men in the PCUSA. I've met them. And what they want is they want the church to change. And they believe that by staying in it, they can change it. That's a matter of debate. But that's what they want to do. They want to change what they've got. Well, this was true of Huss as it was true of Luther and Wycliffe and Thomas Bradwardine and, and the, uh, the, the Waldensians. They wanted to change what already existed. And they pointed out what was obviously erroneous. One of them, of course, was the, uh, the use of Latin. They couldn't understand what was being said. And the Roman church taught that Latin was heaven sent. You couldn't have the scriptures in English. Wycliffe found that out. Why was that? Because it wasn't in Latin. In Czechoslovak, it had to be in Czech. They said, the, the, the authority said, no, it must be Latin. And Huss didn't believe this. Let me, let me tell you what, what he said. Uh, after reading Wycliffe, he said, he became involved in a foolish sect. And then he discovered the Bible. Reading Wycliffe meant he discovered the Bible. When the Lord gave me knowledge of the scripture, I discarded that kind of stupidity from my foolish mind. He'd obviously been involved with something within the Roman church and, and, and he'd call it a foolish sect. When the Lord gave me knowledge of the scripture, we heard that this morning. Pastor Holtz reminded us of the importance of reading the word of God. Well, Huss discovered that. And he was adamant that it should be in uh, Czech, and that people could read it in their own language. Now, he's not known for translating extensively into Czech, but he translated some of the scriptures, but we'll come to that in a moment. They per particularly enjoyed his criticisms of, of the priesthood. The church, you may remember, is believed to be the pope, the prelates, and the priesthood. That was the church. 
If you wanted to join the church, you became a priest. And so that exempted half the population straight away. Women couldn't become priests. So they couldn't belong to the church. And of course, many men couldn't belong to the church. They had neither the education, education or the financial resources, or if they did have financial resources, they really wanted to stay out of anything like this because it meant they had to be unmarried. And so lots of people didn't belong to the church and the only way they could be assured of belonging to the church was to, and to get to heaven was to undergo the, the final uh, moments, as it were, with extreme unction. This was something that was prohibitive in the minds of the people. And so the people enjoyed uh, Hus's criticism of things like this in the church, the, using um, the scriptures. Communion in two kinds. People could only have communion, take the bread. The wine was reserved for the church, that is the priesthood, and it certainly couldn't be given to the laity. He believed that it should be applied in, uh, to both, both kinds or to be given to the people. And the big rub came over indulgences. Now you remember that in Luther's time, this became a big cause as well. So it was never abolished. I don't believe it's abolished to this very day. And, and, a, and, and indulgence is that if you pay a sum of money, your sins are forgiven and you will go to heaven. And you can pay indulgences for people already dead. They're already gone. You give, you buy an indulgence for them and then they will escape from purgatory and go into heaven. I think it applied to people who had gone even further than purgatory. But certainly people were in purgatory when they died and they could be released from it by an indulgence. And he was opposed to that. He believed that forgiveness was not on the, on the basis of money. It was on the basis of repentance. He said so. It's repentance. Now, whilst this is going on, of course, you didn't have the same kind of, of transportation problems or issues as we have today. Today, you would only go on a plane, you get thrown off. In those days, <laughs> you got killed when you travel. You had to travel to Rome. And, uh, and, and, and there was a distance and, and lots of things happened in Rome that it took a long time to percolate back to, to Bohemia. And uh, uh, what happened was that there was a uh, the papacy became divided and in fact for a period of time there were three popes and in fact at one point there were four popes but certainly there were three and most of the time the quarrel was over two. Now which one do you, do you listen to? Which one do you believe? Which one do you follow? So this happened as you may remember uh, in 1378 and this <coughs> continued until uh, 1415 to the Council of Constance uh, which led to the burning of both uh, um, Jerome of, of, of Prague and Jan Hus. Now, Jan Hus spoke to this whole issue of the divided church and uh, the fact that there was no authority. And uh, he, he, he was excommunicated four times by one lot of pope, by one pope and by another pope. They were, but they were all convinced he was a heretic, whichever way you cut the mustard. And, but preaching against indulgences, which happened, offended the, the king. Now, there was a king at this time, and his name was Wenceslas. He was about the third Wenceslas. 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 <laughs> I'm glad I'm not a bohemian. I'm only Welsh myself, and uh, it was much easier. But he offended the, the present Wenceslas because he was getting a cut out of the money for indulgences. They wanted the indulgences to fight a crusade against, um, uh, against the, uh, a king who had attacked Rome and captured it and captured the papacy and was getting the pope to say what he wanted. 
And so the indulgence was issued so that they could raise an army. And, and uh, Huss, of course, thought this was terrible. He said that uh, uh, the vicar of Christ, notice he's a loyal Roman Catholic, that the vicar of Christ should not wage war by force on his enemies, that he should pray for his enemies, he should endure the punishments they laid on him, and that he should, um, and that the church could only forgive sins when people repented rather than when they uh, paid money for it. Well, this ultimately became uh, too much, and uh, King Wenceslas brother, whose name was Sigismund, imagine that, mother naming her son Wenceslas, and then the next one, Sigismund. Anyway, anyway that, that's, those are the thoughts that came through my mind when I was working on this year. But uh, Sigismund was the king of the Romans, who ultimately became the Holy Roman Emperor. And Sigismund wanted to um, uh, get rid of the, um, uh, the confusion in the Church of Rome at the time. Two popes, three popes, four popes, one pope, all the rest of it. And so he decided to encourage uh, the cardinals to call a, con a convocation. And they called it the Council of Constance. It's the 16th ecumenical council of the Roman Church and is still recognized as such by today. Um, in fact, uh, I think it was Pope John the 23rd, or maybe the last Pope, I'm almost sure it was the 23rd, apologized to the, to the Czechoslovaks for having burnt uh, Jan Hus, but that's too late. He was burnt and that was it. Um, and, and Sigismund said to Jan Hus, go to Constance, where the, the council is being held, where the, um, and, and I guarantee your safety. And gave him a letter of uh, a security to make this journey. And so he went. In um, 1414, he went to Constance, which is in Germany. He got there in the October, stayed for a time with a, a widow lady, and then he was arrested. Sigismund was incensed. How could they go against his, um, his safe passage to, to Jan Hus, who, of course, was very popular in Bohemia from whence Sigismund came? But they said to him, look, He's a heretic, and your safe conduct does not obtain for him. Now, what does that mean? Well, they prejudged him. They'd already decided he was a heretic. He hadn't spoken. He hadn't said anything. Of course, he'd written things, biblical things, but they counted him a heretic. And so he had no choice but then to accept uh, that his safe conduct was valueless. He was thrown into prison. Huss was thrown into prison and into a, the dungeon of a Dominican fri friary. Um, that's, that's quite something, really. Um, uh, monks had dungeons. And, um, and there he was. It was a, it was a, a desperate punishment. Um, poor food, um, confined, unable to talk to his friends. And then they decided in December of 1414 that three cardinals would examine what he believed. And that's exactly what they did. They examined him with regard to his beliefs. Let me find a, a sheet that, that, that tells me all of this. Um, and they came to the conclusion that he was a heretic. He wasn't allowed to speak on his own behalf. He was uh, told that he had no voice. People could speak against him. And there were plenty of people to do that within the church. Uh, uh, priests, uh, prelates, they were quite happy to say, 
bad things about him. And they did. And uh, ultimately, they found that there were things he had to recant. The first, that he'd erred in all that he had taught. They accused him of, of Wycliffeism, which had already been banned. And they said he was not permitted, he had uh, continued to preach Wycliffe ideas. And Wycliffe was a pronounced a, a heretic at this uh, council. And his body dug up 10 years later and the ashes burnt and his ashes thrown into the river Swift. But at this time, he was just, all his writings were counted heretics. Heres heresy, sorry. Um, he, he was then, after this time, uh, asked to renounce um, anything that he had said. Well, he said, no, I can't do that. I expect you to... Uh, tell people and show to people that I had erred from the scriptures. But they didn't allow him to answer for himself. They wouldn't show where he had erred in the scriptures. Thirdly, he was to recant everything. He was to turn his back on everything he had taught for 20 years. Well, you can understand that he couldn't do that because that would have meant that all his preaching in Bethlehem Chapel in Prague, all the people that had been influenced and and, and many people had lost their lives as a result of what he taught. Uh, you couldn't do that. And, 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 and finally, he was de declared the opposite of everything he had taught. You know, that forgiveness was by paying money and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Huss was unable to do that. He couldn't accept that. He claimed in the first place that there were many things that were said of him that he'd never taught that was discarded. He asked to be refuted from the scriptures, but nobody was able to do that. And so he was taken away. He was uh, in, in, 15, in 1415, uh, in July of 1415, the early days of July, he was degraded. That is, he was dressed in his priestly clothes. He was brought before a high mass his heresy was exposed. They took all his clothes off him, his priestly clothes. He was reduced to being just a layman. And he was handed over to the secular authority who were commissioned to burn him. And that's what happened. They took him to the banks of Lake Constance. They built a, a, a pyre there. They, they chained him to the stake. They uh, put loads of, of stuff right up to his neck, which wouldn't light. And, and they tried to get this way and that way, and in the end he died a slow and agonizing death. And um, um, he said at the stake, God is my witness that the things charged against me I never preached. In the cause of the truth of the gospel, which I have written, taught, and preached, drawing upon the positions of the holy doctors of the church, I am ready to die today. Of course, he was uh, claiming that much of what he had taught was taught by the fathers of the church, uh, Augustine particularly. We don't have much record of him reading Augustine, but I'm quite sure that amongst all the fathers of the church that he would have read uh, in his studies for the priesthood, he would have read Augustine. And at the stake, his last words, it is said, Christ, son of the living God, have mercy on me. Now, um, I just wanted to say uh, a couple of things and then quote, close with Luther's quote. First of all, Huss's doctrine was not as fully developed as Luther or Calvin. He certainly laid a bedrock for what was to happen. And, and it's possible that he believed in justification by faith. But he never, in all the records of his writings, there is no talk of justification by faith. Which of, for Luther, of course, was the doctrine of the standing or falling of the church. And there's no record of us teaching that. There were uh, obviously other things that he held on to that certainly Luther uh, rejected. Luther, of course, held on to things 
that ultimately Calvin had to deal with. And, um, uh, but, but certainly uh, Huss, a hundred years before him, had not dealt with uh, these issues uh, with regard to justification and sanctification. They were issues to him which belonged in the hand of the church. Um, Luther was to say uh, uh, that they roasted a lean goose. Uh, it was not a full goose, it's not full doctrine. If they'd caught Luther and burnt him, then certainly it would have been a very fat goose. But that was not true of, of, of Huss. There were things that he believed, and I just want to sum up with these. Huss believed that preaching in the Czech language to Czech people was the only way to proclaim the gospel. And that's true today. I've been to sermons uh, with particularly young men who preach very, very complicatedly. They've come out of seminary. They're, they're not familiar with dealing with the common people. I say it for myself. When I went into the ministry, I'd been in college, university, uh, seminary for six years. Uh, all the friends I had, uh, we talked in elevated language, I suppose. It wasn't the language of the common people. And I went in my first church, uh, which I went to uh, 50 years ago, um, I, I became a works chaplain. There was a big factory in the town, and uh, I, I, went to, uh, I went to the management, and I said, could I become your works chaplain? They looked at me as though it was a bit uh, funny. And I said, well, Sir Alfred Owen, who was a, a local dignitary and owned a, 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 a British racing company called the BRM, British Racing Motors, and had a big company down the road. Away. I said, he's got a chaplain. Oh, they said, okay. So I, I was able to be the chaplain. And I went round the works. And they talked in a language that I hadn't spoken. Not only was it sometimes quite salty, but it was certainly very basic. And it was a great education for me. Well, you know, Huss understood the same thing. Preaching should be in language that people could understand. Not only in terms of it being in, in Czechoslovak, but because it was to be simple enough for them to understand it. He believed that indulgences were immoral and had no scriptural warrant. This was a mainstay of the financial support of the Roman Church. Uh, indulgences were the meat and drink of many of the clergy, and he believed they were immoral. And you can imagine that went over like a lead balloon. They really thought that that was a terrible thing to say. They, he believed that those called by God were the church and not the prelates and the priesthood. Can you imagine? We were at Presbytery yesterday. Um, uh, Kevin Joyner, um, Pastor Holst, and myself. Now, if you'd believe that that was the church, But, I believe in Presbyterianism, I believe in the Presbytery. I, I'm glad to belong to the Presbytery. But if that is the church, the church is you. People who've confessed faith. People who believe the gospel. People who live in the regular world. People who, uh, who, who meet with God on a daily basis. Well, he's emphasizing that. He... He believed that ecclesiastical wealth was immoral. It was wrong for the church to be rich. They were to revert to the poverty of the apostles. And they were to be without vast funds at their disposal. Now I know we need to have money in the church. We need to have money to, uh, to do some of the things we need and want to do. But it would be terrible for we if, as, if we made appeals every week to increase your giving, give us more, to have schemes for you to give us money so that we could live in luxury, uh, that, that the elders could uh, drive around in Aston Martin DB6s and things like that. <laughs> Ecclesiastical wealth was immoral. He believed that sin was universal and punishment was universal too. 
that there was nobody exempted from the need of repentance and faith. And that he believed that communion was to be administered in both kinds. This was the only biblical way, in his opinion, was to administer the Lord's Supper in both kinds. Well, for these beliefs, Huss was burned to death. I, I, I think that being burned to death, I think being executed is, um, is a terrible thing for those who are being executed. And uh, it's not something we should indulge in. I believe that crimes deserve um, execution. But to burn somebody when they're alive is something terrible. And it was certainly terrible for, for him. But this is what apparently he said, although Luther took it up and, and um, expanded it, I'm sure. Today you will roast a lean goose. But a hundred years from now, you will hear a swan sing, and no trap or net will catch him for you. Whether Huss said that, or whether Luther adapted that to suit his own case, I don't know. But this I am sure that that indeed did happen. Just 102 years from his execution, 1515, uh, 1415 and 1517, the 95 Theses have been nailed to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral and a swan sang and no trap or net was able to catch him for us. Does anyone have any questions? I think that Jan, Jan, Jan um, uh, sitting there has been following up on this on the, on the internet and maybe he could answer questions than I do. But uh, um, the only information that I got was off the internet. I, I don't have any books and I don't have a biography. Um, I, I had a biography of, um, uh, of Wycliffe written by, to quote um, um, uh, Mrs. Simmons, uh, my friend uh, um, Victor Bergden. But um, I don't have anything on us apart from on the internet. Anyone, any questions? Well, I, I want to thank Tim for getting this lapel mic. It's significantly more comfortable. And now that I'm finishing, I wonder who wear it. Uh, not me, for sure. But uh, I am grateful. Let me just say, uh, Pastor Host uh, said something about this, and I just want to say something. I, I came here three years ago, exactly. We moved into our house in Fuquay uh, three years ago today. and. Uh, uh, and that wasn't on a Sunday, and, uh, and I worshipped here and took part in the worship uh, the following Sunday. Uh, it, they've been uh, three interesting years. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize for a long period of ill health from the fall onwards, and I've not been able to, to do as much as I wanted to do or was able to do. I was glad to have uh, presided over the session while we were in the midst of calling Pastor Host, and uh, it was a particular thrill for me to have a Welshman come to the church. Uh, obviously, I was sent first to acclimate you <laughs> and, um, and for you to be, become familiar with the language of heaven. And, um, and then I was um, privileged to work a little <coughs> bit alongside him. And I'm sure that the ministry here will continue. We'll still be here. Um, we can't move. Uh, we're stuck. And, um, and we, we're worshiping. You know, I, I, let me just say this, and then I'm going to close. I, I don't believe that ministers should stay in churches after they retire. But I feel I can stay for a couple of reasons. One is that I haven't been here long enough. I couldn't, if I'd been here 15 years, then I, I couldn't have stayed. I, I'd have had to go and live. Um, in a tent somewhere, but I, uh, I, I, I couldn't have stayed. But it's been such a brief time, really. And there are no other churches where I would be really comfortable, uh, both with people and with uh, the liturgy, the way in which we worship, and, and the ministry. And so I'm privileged to be able to stay and to help the session until you call someone, just one body, Please, volunteer. Just one body so that I can 
fully retire. But I thank you all for your kindness to me and for your comforting presence. Let's come to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask you to bless us, remind us again of what it means, what it costs to be faithful to the gospel. It cost Jan Hus his life, like it costs so many others, Jerome of Prague, and countless numbers who suffered at the hands of the, of the current church for believing the gospel. We pray now that you would bless us, make us fervent for the gospel. Let us not be willing to bend one part of our faith in order to be safe from the persecutions of others. And may we be happy to belong to the Lord Jesus Christ who endured betrayal, death, and came alive again by the power of the resurrection so that we too might enjoy that eternal blessing of being with him. Bless us now then we pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.